It's very good for Misha to come along. Um, I um, have a sort of slightly personal interest in this, in that, um, as, as I was telling Misha earlier, my wife is Romanian. And uh, just a very quick anecdote. Um, a few years ago, I was in a, trying to get into a Transylvanian nightclub. And uh, it wasn't easy. There were a whole group of guys in front of me who were all very big and very fat and had a lot of gold necklaces and stuff. And I said to my brother-in-law, this is going to, I was so smug. I said, this is going to be pretty straightforward. They'll throw all these guys out and I'll just walk in at the front. And he said, um, you might be surprised. So we got to the front and I offered them, I mean, they looked at me, I was very smart. My wife was very smart. And I offered them $50 uh, to get in, which seemed about the going rate. There was no kind of set price. And they just said, um, no, no, go away. These guys behind me were all kind of mid-40s, huge kind of cannonball men um, who just stepped out of these huge BMWs and all had 13-year-old, 14-year-old girls on their arms and wandered in. They didn't even have to pay. The guys were bowing to them. And I thank Misha for giving me an insight into, seriously, into how all this had happened. I mean, I've been to Romania so many times now, and I never really tried to bind all these different elements together to begin to understand how this had surfaced. And my first question, I suppose, to you is, um, if you could just describe the conditions that are necessary for these situations to emerge, so I'm talking about the globalization and the fledgling capitalist economies. Well, I, I, yeah, I started, in, I started in Eastern Europe and the Balkans because that's where I was. And, and writing about global organized crime um, was quite easy once I'd made a sort of intellectual leap. And that intellectual leap was the realization that uh, what was going on in, in Yugoslavia in particular uh, during the, uh, the wars um, uh, was actually very little to do in terms of motivation with ethnic and confessional antagonism. Uh, but it had a huge amount to do with uh, criminal money-making uh, enterprises. Um, and once I'd made that leap, which was, I, I mean, it was really, a, it was a very simple affair of one and one equals two, because throughout the wars in, in Yugoslavia, all of us who were, were covering the wars, we knew about organized crime because it was absolutely everywhere. It was part of the furniture in the former Yugoslavia. Everything was motivated by uh, money. So, for example, if you wanted to go and, and cover a particular part of, of the war, say, in Bosnia, it frequently meant traveling across lines. And the only way of doing that, in my experience, was to you know, pay people off in order, to, in order to get there. And the people who you were paying off were the, were the paramilitaries. And then, I think, I, I suppose a key thing when I started to get interested in it was, was Arkan's occupation, not so much of, of uh, Vukovar, but of eastern, the, the slither of eastern Slovenia in, in eastern Croatia as a whole, the Edut region, where you had both oil and vineyards. And this was the beginning of Arkan's uh, sort of criminal empire. It was what I, I refer to in the book as, as a primitive capital accumulation. Um, and I, all, of a, you know, all of a sudden I realized that while we had been re reporting two stories separately, one is the business of organized crime and the lawlessness that emerged in the former Yugoslavia and everywhere else in, in Eastern Europe. And the other was the war, which was a somehow separate event. When I, when I sort of brought the two together, when I was actually working not, not in journalism, but I set up a, a little NGO trying to encourage cross-border cooperation in South Serbia, Eastern Kosovo, and Northern Macedonia. Um, and suddenly realizing that nothing moved, nothing happened, nothing worked without organized crime, I then said, actually, this is how we should be looking at the post-communist post world. Um, we should be looking at it in terms of people. 
wanting to make money and there being no clear legal framework for them to do that. And so those people with muscle, with power, with physical power, the ability to wield violence, were actually seizing the sort of heights of the economy uh, the economy and politics. Are you, and saying, are you saying there's kind of, there was a healthfulness about that in the sense that without organized crime at some kind of level it wouldn't have progressed quite so quickly that they were bringing it on? It wasn't so much that there was a healthiness but that it wouldn't have happened without organized crime because when communism collapses all over East, Eastern Europe it's not just the ideology which collapsed which in any case had been in uh, you know terminal a state of petrification for some years. It was the state that collapsed everywhere. And so, you know, the police forces weren't working properly. The court system certainly wasn't working properly. Um, and um, the uh, economy was going south absolutely everywhere. And so what people were doing was, again, those people with muscle, those people with connections, with influence, were grabbing the assets. And so they would literally, um, uh, this is now going beyond Yugoslavia into, mm -hmm. into, into Russia as well. They would literally, the guy I, I, I write about, and he's emblematic, he's not the only one, um, uh, even Pavlov in, in Bulgaria. Pavlov uh, literally went with his heavies and with his friends from the secret police to uh, the director of a big factory uh, in Sofia or Plovdiv or wherever, wherever it was. And he said, we're going to take you over. You are now going to buy goods, your raw materials, at prices that we determine from our company, and you will sell them at the prices that we determine to our company on the other, at the other end of your factory. And... Uh, and that was it. This guy who was basically a huckster, of course he had been a professional, uh, not a professional, but a, a champion wrestler, um, which was very important. Um, uh, he, uh, he said, effectively, this factory is ours. And the director of the factory could do nothing about it because standing in front of him was Pavlov, a former champion wrestler, Dmitry Ivanov, who was a <coughs> former head of the sixth directorate of the, of the DS, the um, state security of Bulgaria, which was known affectionately as the Gestapo by Bulgarians, <laughs> uh, and the deputy head of the Independent Free Trades Union, which was being bankrolled by the American embassy at the time, although the Americans didn't know that this was going on as far as I understand. But what I found amazing was that um, <laughs> all these individuals that you talk about um, this wasn't something, I mean, I remember my father-in-law saying to me, the day, you know, the, the, there was communism, everybody was sort of equal, and then the day after, some people were very rich instantly. But of course, that wasn't the case. And sort of for the, the, the year or two before that, people saw the writing on the wall, and we're talking politicians, security service, um, uh, wrestlers, funnily enough, in Bulgaria. Yeah. Um, these people saw it, and they started preparing the channels, the infrastructure, if you like, to make it work afterwards. That was the incredible thing, is that really, if you look at the, at the documentation, is that the secret police all over, including the KGB, um, uh, the Yugoslavs who uh, you know, could, had a very good sense for what was going on uh, in Russia, uh, once Gorbachev had taken power and started enabling the, uh, the foundation of, of things like joint stock companies where you could have 49% of effectively private capital, um, what happened was that these new companies were bought up by members of the security services so that the security services were preparing for the post-communist period, because they knew on. what was the, in 85, 86 is so when it starts happening. Before, four or five years beforehand, they were hedging their bets. They didn't know which way ideologically it was going to turn. But should the whole thing come tumbling down, they were going to be in pole position to make a lot of money in a very short space of time. And some of the kind of the foresight was absolutely astonishing. Um, the uh, military intelligence in Yugoslavia, COS, which basically became rolled into the, to the sort of Serbian 
uh, um, the Serbian side in the Yugoslav Wars, uh, in 1988-89, they managed to successfully insert a member of theirs onto the board of Ilya Pavlov's company, Multigroup. And um, so that when sanctions were imposed on Serbia in 1992, um, and they needed to get goods from all over the neighboring countries into Serbia, which they did. I mean, those sanctions were a disaster in all sorts of ways. They actually had someone on the board of one of the key companies, military intelligence, in Bulgaria, directing material uh, into Serbia. So they were, they were way ahead of the game. And capitalism was built by people who were privileged in, um, under communism, no longer had the communist structure to you know, do things, and so basically privatized themselves. And this is what gangsterism was. It was, you know, it was a form of privatized law enforcement and, and control. Because I'm interested in all these disparate ends that you bring together. So you're talking about security services, politicians, wrestlers again. Um, but morally, what's quite interesting is what were the, I mean, morally, if you got rid of law and order in several countries around the world, possibly including the UK, I don't think gangsterism would rise, I hope not, quite so quickly. So in terms of the moral conditions to be available, the climate to be right, what was it that made Eastern Europe sort of this, this hotbed of it? I don't think that it's specifically Eastern Europe. I mean, you know, I, I remember a very striking thing that a friend of mine from Kosovo said uh, uh, about three or four years ago. He said, he said, look, youth unemployment in Kosovo is now running about 70%, right? And although, yes, we have a big problem with organized crime, um, we're not slashing people's throats in the street at the moment. What would happen, he said, if you had a youth unemployment rate in London of 70%, mm -hmm. how stable do you think your city would be in that event? And I think he had, a, he, th he had a very good point. One of the things that happened in Eastern Europe, as the state, remember, which was above all the main employer in Eastern Europe, the state withers and collapses unexpectedly, and a lot of people are out of work. Now, including in those were the wrestlers who were underwritten by the state, <laughs> uh, you know, for their greater glory every four <laughs> years at the Olympic Games. Um, but also, uh, I mean, in Bulgaria, again, uh, between 89 and 1991, 14,000 members of the security forces were sacked. I mean, uh, partly because the state couldn't afford it, and partly because it was in the sort of, you know, spirit of, of, um, of uh, democratization, of let's dismantle this terrible secret police. Mm. And these are 14,000 people whose main skills were building underground networks, surveillance, <laughs> smuggling, and killing people, mm. you know? And so what are they going to do if they're unemployed? They're going to build networks and kill people, and that's mm. exactly what they did. Now, what's really interesting, I, this is a slight diversion, but when Iraq happened later on, and we went into Iraq, and then dismantle the civil service and the army. And then everyone is kind of shocked when the insurgency begins based on the civil service and the army. We knew it all because, you know, the CIA had monitored what had gone on in Bulgaria, had monitored what had gone on in Russia. MI6 knew very well what was happening there, that you had this privatization of law enforcement um, and that people just seized power. And so you know, when, when Iraq happened, I mean, to me, it just made it all the more crass because the blueprint was only, you know, 10 years previous mm. to the whole thing. Absolutely astonishing. I'm, I'm going to stick with Eastern Europe just for a while because um, I'm interested in what happens to the middle classes during all this. So I'm talking about the intellectuals. Uh, yeah. And, you know, there's, it's almost like there's an inversion, isn't there, here, taking place, where uh, the people who were generally at the bottom of the pile, if you like, perhaps during communism, so I'm talking about general thuggery, um, suddenly come out on top, and the middle classes get left behind, and they're the people uh, across Eastern Europe now who are on salaries of £1,000 a year or whatever, and really find it very difficult to make ends meet. And, you know, the, the, the way that they are now oppressed, and so the aspiration now in all these East European countries, I think, is to be, the aspiration is to be one of those top people, which means to be a thug. Well, uh, <clears throat> we have to be careful here about class definition. Um, 
I think the intellectuals, to a degree, uh, form a, certainly under communism, a, a useful, a useful definition. Mm. Or, um, uh, but uh, afterwards, it's certainly true. You know, one of the. I mean, what happened when the wall came down is, is there was no. Uh, there was no real inkling in the West that the wall was going to come down as dramatically as it did. I mean, even at the beginning of 1989, when things were beginning to move in Hungary and Poland, the policy discussions in the Foreign Office and in the, in the Bundesämter in, in Bonn were all about... The, the words were kind of Finlandization of Eastern Europe, that the Soviet Union would remain, they would have a security blanket in Eastern Europe, and there would be some kind of democratization of, of Eastern Europe. And that at relatively high levels. So from 86 to 89, there was no real planning going on in the West about what would happen when Eastern Europe uh, fell. And so, you know, when it goes, it goes very dramatically, and what we assumed initially was that the place was peopled by tens of millions of Václav Havels. You know, that everyone would turn around and be extremely <laughs> kind of reasonable about the fact that they're unemployed along with tens of thousands of others in their town as well. And of course, you know, Havel, in a sense, was swept aside, and the relationship with Václav Klaus, the present president of the Czech Republic is very instructive because Havel went off to the castle and scooted down the corridors and invited Frank Zappa in. And Václav <laughs> Klaus was building up a huge and fairly ruthless party organization, which is basically on a very right-wing agenda, controlled Czechoslovakia for the last, uh, or the Czech Republic for the last 10 years or so. And this was happening uh, and Klaus, like many major politicians who seize that opportunity, has become very, very rich as a consequence. What you, what you had, I mean, Russia in a way is very instructive because it has the mineral resources and the wealth is absolutely enormous. So, uh, and you can see it quite, quite clearly in Russia is, is that a group of opportunist, opportunistic entrepreneurs who became known as the, the oligarchs seized hold of the uh, mineral resources of Russia, the oil, and the, uh, the oil and the gas. What they would do is buy it at subsidized Soviet prices because those prices, when all other prices uh, in Russia were liberated at the end of 91, beginning of 92, bizarrely, the prices of mineral resources were kept at their subsidized level. So the oligarchs would buy their oil and gas in Siberia for a dollar a barrel and then sell it in the Baltic states for $30 a barrel, uh, which is essentially a license to print, a print, to print money. Now, <clears throat> they needed around them all sorts of protection because they had so much money. And this is where the vast organized crime syndicates in Moscow, St. Petersburg, Yekaterinburg, and other parts of Russia built up, were built up, um, often staffed by ex-KGB mem uh, members, I mean, up, up, up to ex-KGB generals. Um, and most of the big oligarchs we know who are all part of the argy-bargy between Gordon Brown and, and Medvedev um, uh, now in, in G8 summit, they all had KGB people operating on their behalf. And so this was the best example of the privatized law enforcement agency as a way of facilitating this, what I call the greatest larceny in, uh, uh, in, in, in history. Why, by the way, why didn't you, I was interested, I may have misread this, but I didn't see Abramovich mentioned anywhere. Did you steer clear on purpose? I, it was uh, quite pure and simple, you know. When I was in, I, I, I interviewed a really interesting guy who had set up the anti-Russian organized crime intelligence unit in Tel Aviv in 1995. And uh, I asked him this question. I said, look, you know, if I write all this stuff, um, are they going to come after me? <laughs> you know, will I get a, a bullet in the back of my, in the back of the neck? And he said, he said, oh, no, 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 they're not nearly that crude. They won't shoot you, but they'll sue you to death. Mm. And everyone knows, you know, I mean, we're sitting here, there is a story going on at the moment with the, the, the 
dispute between Berezovsky and, and yeah. Abramovich uh, in court here in the United Kingdom, which, if trawled properly, can <coughs> reveal, and indeed the Times has come up with some very interesting stuff uh, already. But basically, I'm not going to, if, if you look at the book, a lot of the main characters are already dead. And that is, <laughs> that was quite simply Very useful, isn't it, legally? a security measure <laughs> on my part so that they wouldn't come after me either physically or legally. Um, and then, God, you know, there is a God earlier this year. Two of the main characters, Victor Boot, the big arms dealer, was picked up finally in Thailand. And Semyon Magilevich, the king of gas distribution in Russia, was arrested by uh, R Russian tax authorities. Now, this is, this is really interesting because Magilevich was able to make his huge fortune, and he's a real gangster, Magilevich. I can say that now because I know he's much too busy sitting there in, <laughs> <laughs> in the Lubyanka or wherever he is um, uh, to worry about anything I have to say about him. But. Um, he was, uh, you know, that that I was that I was worried about. But even Magilevich, I write about very, very carefully. Yeah, I think it was all fairly carefully written, those, but and very beautifully written. <laughs> That's partly because it had a, we spent about two months doing a legal read through, and about did. a third of it was taken out. So. I, I, what, what I thought was great, I mean, one of the most memorable bits was um, the Chechen mafia. And um, I think that's probably where the title of the book came from. I had this, funny enough, on a coffee table at home the other day, and one of my friends came around and said, McMafia, is it about the Scottish Mafia? And, um, <laughs> and, but what I really like about the Chechen Mafia is this idea, which you can elaborate on, but the idea that they franchise out their name. And I don't know how many people have, uh, have read the book, but the idea that it's such a powerful and ruthless entity uh, that what they can do is they can rent out their name to other people and if people misuse it, i.e., as you were saying, if they're not ruthless enough, then the Chechen Mafia will go and kill them for using their name by not, but not being ruthless enough. And I wondered, just, just tell us a bit about that because, I mean, that, to me, that was one of the most remarkable bits in the book. This is, uh, first of all, the nature of organized crime changed in the early 1990s where the model of the Sicilian Mafia which, um, on, on which there was, a, you know, there was a great deal of um, uh, emphasis put on clan and family loyalty. You know, that if somebody was insulted, then that was a matter for the whole clan. Um, and I'll explain, I'll explain using the, the Sopranos in a minute exactly how well that was demonstrated by that marvelous, marvelous series on television. Um, and what people realized in the early 1990s, as the Mafia was destroying itself, partly because, the Sicilian Mafia, partly because of, of clan loyalty, just at the time when the global narcotics market was about to go haywire, and the Sicilian Mafia could almost be a shadow global government now, they were distracted by internecine, internecine quarrels. And what happened in the 1990s is the new mafias coming in realized that, you know, this was all a, a, a waste of time. Why would we divert the resources of our whole organization um, because of some spat over a girlfriend, okay? <laughs> and it's in The Sopranos, there's this, fan, there's this fantastic thing where, um, where Tony Soprano is with is in a car crash with his nephew, Christopher Moltisanto. And throughout the series, this is coming towards the end of the series, Moltisanto is uh, both the object of Tony's greatest affection, uh, but he's also the member of the Soprano family who creates more problems for Tony than anyone else. And what Tony begins to see is, is that Christopher through his, through his actions, uh, are drawing the heat of other families onto the Sopranos, drawing the police onto the Sopranos, and even drawing the press onto the Sopranos, uh, Sopranos and so public opprobrium. And so they have this car crash, and, Tony, and, and Christopher is still alive. Tony gets out of it, and he sees Christopher there, and he suddenly realizes Christopher has done too much damage to the family, and he kills him. 
And this is a really iconic moment because it's when The Sopranos ceases to be an old style organized crime agency and becomes a new style one. And what happened in the real world was that it was not the level of violence that you were able to deploy that was critical to be a successful organized crime group. It was your ability to project a credible threat of violence that became key. Mm. But a credible threat of violence meant that if push came to shove, then you had to be utterly ruthless and victorious. And that is where the, the, the sort of you know, mythology about the Albanians or the Russians or the Chechens or the Georgians as being completely new you know, in their ruthlessness. That's where it comes from, that when the, when the violence is deployed, it is so ghastly that people are terrified to see a repeat of it. And this is what the franchising of the name the Chechen Mafia emerged from. Those people who assumed the name of the Chechens, which in some places really had no Caucasians in them whatsoever, it was only Slavs, they had, first of all, they had to pay a significant tribute to the Chechen Mafia in Moscow, not in Grozny, but in Moscow. Um, uh, but they, uh, you know, they, they also had to prove, if push came to, shove, came to shove, that they would be as ruthless as the Chechen Mafia. And one of the the, the massive things that was going on, and the person who would be able to explain this to you because he was right in the center of it, it'd be very instructive uh, at some point to hear from him, is Boris Berezovsky, mm. is the struggle between the Slav, the Chechen uh, groups, particularly, uh, well, the, the Sonsevo Slav group in Moscow, the Chechen group, and also the politics around two things. One, the Chechen war, um, because although the Chechen Mafia was not directly related to what went on in, in uh, Chechnya, they were indirectly uh, directly related. And the other is the control of the oil terminals in Odessa, in Ukraine, which in theory an independent country, but as the main export port of uh, all the uh, oil coming out of Russia was the critical uh, zone for for many of the mafias. Now this is a history which, you know, had it had it been on a state level, had this been the Thirty Years' War or whatever, we would I'm sure already having you know we would already have major historians looking into what was going on. I suspect that the history of Odessa, which is absolutely critical to the 1990s in Russia, will never ever be written and recognised on a sort of global scale amongst. Uh, uh, historians, because uh, because it's so murky, um, but you know this is where the economy uh, had its you know had its critical critical point in the 1990s in Russia. Tell us how you go about drawing all these kind of disparate threads together, because I started reading and I thought this is going to be about Eastern Europe, which I know Misha writes a lot about, and which I find particularly fascinating, and then it kind of moves on to Colombia and Brazil. And I mean, it's it's and, and India, um, and are these all just separate events that are taking place, or is there a common theme, a common strand through those? Well, they're separate. They're separate kind of narrative stories which bump into each other, and they bump into each other because you have these two huge events that take place, not unrelated, uh, within the space of four years. One is the advent of globalization. Uh, you know, the the trigger of Reaganism and Thatcherism. Although you could argue that it begins in the Nixon period, but I won't bother to do that because also it spoils the kind of, you know, uh, complementarity of the two <laughs> events. And the, yes. other is, uh, the other is the fall of, of communism. So with the fall of communism, you have the opening up of this huge transitional space uh, across Eastern Europe, from Eastern Europe through to China, but also transitional spaces in countries like, in continents like Africa, vast transitional spaces, uh, where the old order is, is, you know, thrown up into the air, all that is solid melts into air, uh, and all sorts of things can happen. Everyone can grab this, that, and the other, and no one really knows what's going on, combined with the liberalization of financial and commodity markets that come, becomes to be known as as, as, as globalization. And so with that, you get an acceleration of uh, migratory patterns, 
of trade patterns and of, um, uh, of uh, uh, capital flows uh, around the world. And this is where they start bumping into each other. One of the things that happens for in, in Russia uh, is that the oligarchs know full well that the Russian state, which is a powerful beast, is going to wake up from its hibernation at some point. And so the oligarchs are sending money out of Russia as fast as their little legs can carry them, which is, you know, quite fast, actually. It's between two to three hundred billion dollars over a ten-year period. Ironically, over the same ten-year period, the IMF was shoveling $200 billion into Russia to keep the ruble stable. So we were actually, not only was you know, Russia being <coughs> ripped off wholeheartedly by the oligarchs, but we were subsidizing it as international taxpayers. This last thing, quite extraordinary. Anyway, they had to find places to put, to put the money. And this is the time when the liberalization of financial markets are going whoosh. And you're getting all sorts of countries all over the place desperate to attract capital. And so it's a money launderer's paradise. And so Russian money bumps up against Colombian money, mm -hmm. bumps up after 1994 and before 1994 against South African money. Can I just ask you, just to butt in there, I mean, when they do bump up against each other, yeah. um, and you talk a little bit about, I think it's the Russian uh, mafia, or one arm of it, uh, and the Colombians, uh, the Colombian cocaine dealers. I mean, are, they, are we talking about sort of on a practical level, meeting and discussing and making agreements, or are these people kept separate? Well, in cocaine, we had a spectacular corporatization. Uh, which was um, uh, typified by the meeting in late 1992 uh, in Aruba between representatives of the Cali and Medellin cartels, um, uh, was represented by a couple of Italian lawyers who were based in Brazil, mm -hmm. and uh, the Sonseva organization from Moscow. So this um, was a meeting? This so was a meeting. This was a meeting, and the meeting was quite specific. The, the point was is that the Colombians were saying, look, We've supersaturated the American market. 5% of the world's population, 40% of the world's cocaine consumption. They can't take any more up their nose in the United States. We've got to send it somewhere else. Europe, what a fantastic place. A lot of yuppies, a lot of rich people. And half of it is just beginning to open up, and there's bound to be some yuppies there. And uh, so uh, they agreed. They set up new, the, the standard way of getting coke into Europe was through Spain and, and Amsterdam. They set up the West African and South African routes. So coke comes through Brazil to West Africa, South Africa, and then up into Europe. They also set up a Bulgarian route going from Chile and Brazil into Bulgaria, into Croatia, uh, and then up into uh, the European Union. Um, and so this was a really corporatized uh, mm -hmm. event. I, for reasons which I don't fully understand, that corporatization kind of drifted away uh, after that in, with most commodities. I, I think it's partly because that shift that I was talking about, about clan loyalty, also had its uh, uh, roots in the business model is is that people realize that if you decentralize things when you're shifting illicit commodities um, uh, so that you create cell structures as opposed to rigid hierarchies um, taking from sort of classic insurgencies that means that if the organization is decapitated, decapitated then the trade can still go on because it's still functioning on a cell level uh, lower down. And this is exactly what happened with both the Medellin and the Cali cartels in, in Colombia. The DEA had a spectacular success in decapitating both of them with the death of Escobar in 93 and then the taking down of Cali in 1995. What happened to the movement of coke um, from Colombia into the United States, it continued to increase, the price continued to go down. So although you had these spectacular law enforcement successes in terms of personnel and the people who were making most money out of it, you didn't have any impact on the movement of coke from Colombia to uh, the US or indeed later on to Europe. Now you have a kind of a hierarchy of different um 
uh, illicit activities, if you like, that um, these mafias get involved with. And I think he was, um, in no particular order, I mean, it's kind of drugs, sex, diamonds. And, and where does caviar come in? Well, caviar, I feel sorry. I mean, you laugh, but I really do. I feel very sorry for the sturgeon. I mean, you know. There's an, sorry, just to fill you in, there's an amazing bit in the book where Misha goes and smuggles out, not particularly smuggles out, but does something that's kind of semi-legal, no, no, stroke illegal, smuggles out quite a large amount of caviar. And he did, it was one of those moments when you're reading a book where you think, um, I could probably go and do that. And I you could, could probably make more than I make in the BBC just by doing this, just a bit around the fringes I could get into. Absolutely right. <laughs> Um, uh, the point was is that I kind of, well, first of all, I mean, two things about the book is, is that I wanted to go and speak to people who were involved in what I call the shadow economy, I, uh, you know, people involved in organized crime. But I also wanted to see, can you do it? You know, because you always, you read the papers and you hear about these stories about, you know, people doing this, that, and the other, and you think, God, because I'm terribly bad about, about corruption. I'm not good at paying people off, you know. It's a terrible thing always. It was, I remember it from Eastern Europe, because I had to do it in Eastern Europe. I felt so sheepish about putting a 10 mark note into my passport as I handed it over to the East German traffic <laughs> cop, or just, you know, handing over 50 marks to the Bulgarians and... And they mm. let you go, and I always thought, oh my God, oh, yeah. it worked. You know, because I, I always felt, oh my God, you're he's going to bust gonna be me arrested for, immediately for yeah. corrupting a public <laughs> official. And of course, no, that doesn't happen. <laughs> so anyway, so I thought, right, okay, let's do a big one. Let's go and do some caviar. So, um, so I was fortunately I've been invited to a conference in uh, Almaty, and so I went to Almaty and took the plane to Atrau, which is where both the oil centre and the caviar centre, um, just at the, at the mouth of the Ural, at the, at the Ural River. And uh, I had these fantastic, you know, this book is written because you have journalists all over the world who for a pittance, believe you me, I mean, you know, and who, who put their lives on the line all the bloody time to investigate this sort of thing, which nobody except a few NGOs and a few embassy office, officers ever read. And these two who I, uh, who I, who I spoke to in, in Atra, who took me around and showed me, showed me everything, God, God bless them, they were a married couple. Um, uh, uh, they, uh, they documented for me the whole of the, the, the caviar mafia from the early 1990s, you know, when they used to come in, I, first of all, it was, you know, they'd jump off trains with, with uh, machine guns and things like that. And then they had, you know, armed, armed destroyers and boats off the coast of Atrau coming in and seizing the bloody stuff. Just incredible. Um, I mean, people have made themselves incredible. I mean, we did all laugh because it sounds ridiculous. Yeah. But people have made themselves incredibly wealthy out of this, haven't they? And there's violence behind it as well. Hugely wealthy, and there was this, you know, there was this glut. And the reason, the reason is, I mean, what would happen is, is the, the caviar would go to go to Moscow. A lot of it would hang around in Moscow, but most of it was sent off to the European Union, to the United States, and actually, percentage-wise, a huge amount went to the United. Arab uh, Emirates, and we ended up eating it. And this mm -hmm. is something that, you know, when this was going on in Eastern Europe, that it is all driven by the fact that we consume illicit goods and services. Are they illicit because it's illegal, like cocaine, possibly? Are they illicit because they have an incredible cachet like caviar? Um, or are they illicit because we put very high taxes mm. on them like cigarettes. Well, exactly, because all, I mean, some of these things, you would think, they sound like low-level crimes. So you're saying, caviar, we all have a laugh. Cigarettes, um, I mean, all these little things and, and the bribery that goes on around them, and you start from a very low level in that and work up. So all these things that sound like tiny little tadpoles um, all become, if you like, sort of enormous sharks. I mean, they, they build up, don't they, all and these those things. what those sharks did in the Ural River was basically to eat up all the sturgeon. <laughs> and this is, you know, I mean, this really is, I mean, it's been completely devastated, the, the mm. sturgeon population uh, of the northern Caspian Sea. The Iranians 
have a, a more benign regime, it has to be said, although they're a little bit disingenuous with it, but I have to take my head off, they did better than, than everyone else around that area. But, uh, you know, the Sturgeons basically had it. You know, within 15 <laughs> to 20 years, most of the belugas are going to, I, I mean, the belugas were, are heading for extinction at the moment. And mm. what you've seen as a consequence is when the belugas are teetering on extinction, then all of a sudden you get the development of paddlefish, which are a type of sturgeon. Paddlefish farms in Western Canada and the United States, which produce caviar, they're, a mm. they're a part of the sturgeon family, produce caviar, which is almost as good. Well, I don't want to but, sorry about this. I didn't expect yeah. it to be a natural history interview for a moment, <laughs> but I do think it's quite interesting that um, all of us, not all of us, I mean, if, if you smoke, you tend to buy, I've always bought cheap cigarettes when I used to smoke, uh, people will quite happily buy cheap alcohol. We will now buy cheap fuel if there's an opportunity. And that is part of the problem, isn't it? That this is one of the, the reasons it's a global problem, is that actually all of us here, almost certainly, given the opportunity to save money, financially we, we would take it and the people who benefit are the people that you talk about in the book. Absolutely. You know, and I did it as well. Like, yeah, I mean, I used to buy uh, those Thanks. When I was like, I made the right decision. I gave up, um, uh, but it took me a long time to give up. And during the 1990s, I was buying I was buying cigarettes outside of Safeways on Holloway Road for two pounds a packet, one pound fifty a packet. Mm. And uh, you know, when I started researching this book and realised that I was underwriting mm. the Croat and Serbian paramilitaries with this, I did feel I felt I you know because I, I kind of. I knew very, very vaguely, but when I worked out exactly who was making money out of it, I felt awful. I felt yeah, really bad. So, um, but I mean, just finally, then we'll throw it open to the floor. And this is a terrible but typical journalist question. I mean, ultimately, there has to be some kind of solution to this. Mm. And where does the solution lie? I mean, what you paint is a very dark picture of sinister forces behind a lot of the world's major economies. Um, and I'm wondering if there's anything, or if it's too late, that we can do about it. Well, there are, you have to look. You have to look long term, and you have to look short term. Long term, this is a problem of supply and demand. On the supply side, you have to uh, 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 concentrate on poverty eradication programs. Okay, and that's you know there are all sorts of other things going on, um, uh, but basically it's poverty eradication. Uh, on the demand side, you know, you have, we have to get everyone to look at themselves in the developed world who consume the uh, uh, goods and services which are, which are illicit and which generally come from, uh, from the developing world. The one commodity which, where it's the other way around is arms, mm. where it goes from the developed world into the developing world, but facilitated quite often by the same people. So we have to, who, who are not necessarily non-state actors, I hasten to add. Um, so that is the long term, is looking at our demand culture, the whole consumerist culture and blah, 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 and the supply side, the fact that people, duh, are obviously going to sell cocaine when, or, or heroin or opium in Afghanistan when it sustains their children and nothing else anyone is offering is going to sustain their children. So that's, that's one thing. Then you have the issue of policing, um, which is the short-term short issue. And there are two issues about policing. First of all, there's policy. So, and this is where I get controversial, and that's on narcotics. Um, You're in favor of them, in general. <laughs> no, I'm not in favor of them. I'm in favor of them uh, being uh, appropriated by the state into legal markets as opposed to illegal markets. Which is to say, I'm in, favor of, I'm in favor of legalization. Or, let me put it this way. Why don't we think about, uh, uh, since 1990, okay, we, our policy is the war on drugs. The war on drugs posits that we have to throttle the production narcotics at the point of production, i.e. in Colombia or Afghanistan, well, that isn't working, or, uh, and at the same time, we have to prevent the end user from getting access to those. Well, Paddington, have a walk around Paddington. I bet you that, that most of us here with a bit of nerves could come back 
with any number of A-class drugs within two hours if we really put our minds to it mm -hmm. without being arrested. Did you, just okay. one final thing before we put it. But, uh, but, uh, but yeah, let me on. just finish that very, uh, uh, very briefly, uh, on, because this may come up on the, on the narcotics thing, is, is that uh, at the moment <laughs> what we're doing with narcotics is we are giving money to people who are very, very, very nasty. We are absenting ourselves uh, from the market. We are guaranteeing maximum social distress in the countries of consumption. And we are devastating countries in the area of production. Mm. But what choice do they have in someone like Colombia, which you mentioned, and which I've been to too, that they, um, you know, uh, what, 10 years ago, they were all selling or growing bananas, oranges, whatever you like, and getting, I know, three pounds a kilo. I mean, there is financially, it only makes sense to grow coca. Exactly, is... because the market is illegal. The reason why it makes sense financially to do it is because, because of the illegality of the market, that confers on the commodity much more value than in a legal, normal market it would have. And that's why they have to grow coca, is because it's the only thing which gives them sufficient funds to feed their family. Um, which is fine if you're a cocalero somewhere in the highlands of Brazil and you don't really, you know, uh, uh, Bolivia and you don't really mind. However, if you're a peasant or a policeman in the distribution area of northern Mexico, you're dead or you're close to being dead because of this trade, because of consumption in the United States and because it's illegal. Northern Mexico, I mean, you know, we used to... Uh, I can't believe what is happening in, in, in that zone, and it's all because of the war on drugs. Now, if you look at Afghanistan, the Taliban was a defeated military entity in 2003. For the first time in 180 years or so, uh, people who've been interfering in Afghanistan over that period had an opportunity to resurrect that country through a pr the Im implementation of a proper developmental program. Instead, of course, we went off to Iraq and invaded that in cell, in, in, instead, and we, we neglected what was going on in Afghanistan. The Taliban recognized that, they reorganized, and they refinanced themselves by becoming the main taxation uh, uh, agency of the opium trade in Afghanistan. And now by the admission of the UNODC, which is largely funded by the United States, they make over a hundred million dollars a year out of opium. And with that, they buy weapons. And with that, um, and the assistance of regional intelligence agencies, as the Afghan government has it, uh, they blow up embassies and they kill NATO personnel and they destroy any opportunity of developing Afghanistan. So the time has come to decide, do you want some form of regional development in Central Asia or do you want the war on drugs? But you cannot have both. Mm -hmm. Right. On that note, we'll throw it open to the floor. And um, please, um, I think there's a microphone. You, you may not need it. But. Um, Misha, can you follow up though? You haven't mentioned... It's, sorry to be a pain. It's just because they're recording it. Sorry. <laughs> she, yeah, she needs it. Yeah, good. Can you follow up, please, on um, banking and major structural reform of the post-war groups? You mentioned the IMF and Russia there, but you, if you haven't mentioned at all about greater transparency. For example, if all the banks were to quit taking cash deposits, et cetera. Yeah. Okay, money laundering, you're absolutely right. Money laundering is at the center of all of this. The flow of cash is at the heart of everything. And banking is where the licit economy meets the illicit economy. And there's a large gray area where you're not sure wh whether it's illicit or, 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 or illicit. We, uh, we persist. Uh, uh, first of all, a very simple thing. Offshore banking, this makes it happen, okay? Um, if you want to do something about money laundering, if you want to do something about crime, if you want to do something about tax evasion and corporate fraud, get rid of offshore banking as your first step. There was a debate in the Clinton administration at the highest level about going to the offshore banks, putting a gun to their head and saying, go on shore, uh, otherwise we're going to close you down. And the US can do that because of the amount of trade and the amount of... Um, 
because because of the fact that the dollar is the reserve currency. There was a debate in the Clinton administration, and those who favoured that action lost. Um, the OECD kicked in about 10 years ago with uh, its demand for the legislation and implementation of uh, Foreign Corrupt Practices Acts around the world. And here, um, perhaps surprisingly, although I think I know why, and it's a, it's a very positive reason, the United States has turned out to be the market leader. They prosecute more people, more Americans, for foreign corrupt practices than the European Union more or less put, to, put together. The European Union, for all of its touchy-feely stuff inside the EU, is utterly ruthless about using bribes to gain market share in countries like China. Um, and uh, this has got to stop. BAE systems, it's axiomatic that that sort of thing uh, has to stop because I can tell you in Beijing and Lagos they were opening champagne when uh, Tony Blair ordered the SFO to drop on BAE systems. Um, so, but uh, foreign corrupt practices, which the OECD has insisted on, is a really good starting point. The next thing uh, is. Uh, is uh, banks and, and how you go about regulating, which is very, very difficult. One doesn't want to make banks uncompetitive. However, I think politically, with the credit squeeze, we've come to a moment whereby you've got two forces coming together. One is people who recognize that money laundering and corruption is a real problem around the world. And one is people who recognize that the kind of obscene speculation which has resulted in the credit, credit squeeze uh, is also no way to run a railroad, i.e. it's inefficient for, inefficient for global capitalism. So now is the time um, to come together and say, OK, we do have to start looking about the way that banks, hedge funds, uh, private equity funds, um, uh, work and how they get their money because if you you know you have uh, major financial institutions confessing that they don't know how much money they've lost and where it came from then you know that something is broke and so you've got to start fixing it so this I think is the moment with the end of the Bush administration um, uh, Obama coming in um, I, I say that as a matter of conviction because, because I really don't want McCain to come in. Nice enough bloke, but I don't want him to come in. Obama coming in, the end of the Blair, Blair era here in, in the United Kingdom. So there's a faux pas there. <laughs> um, and uh, we have an opportunity to start thinking about, about the way that global finance is, is structured both in terms of the money laundering and in terms of, of uh, financial speculation. I don't suppose for a minute that it will happen, but the political moment is there which might allow it to happen. Okay, we, we've got a... Well, I, yeah, go on. No, you can't have a follow-up. That's ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, this is Theo Val. I was wondering whether you could speculate about there being any positive aspects to organised crime. <laughs> I, I've, Cheap cigarettes. I've, uh, look, I've, <laughs> don't get me wrong. I, in terms of state stability. No, I'm, I am positive about organised crime in some <laughs> respects. Uh, I mean, the whole thing about, you know, uh, in, in Eastern Europe, the economies wouldn't have worked without organised crime. They were the people who, you know, delivered food on the tables. The, reason, the, the problem with organized crime is the system, it, it worked relatively efficiently. It was certainly extremely unbureaucratic. Um, but the, the problem is this, is, is that uh, it gets things going and keeps things moving, but it doesn't have any accountability. And so although you have in Medellin, for example, you have Escobar building churches, hospitals, schools, and everyone in Medellin saying, you know, he the man, we love him and everything. This is great. Um, if Escobar decides he doesn't like that district, that district doesn't get schools 
and say, screw the kids in that district. So that is the problem with organized crime as a, as a system where it effectively uh, seizes control from any state institution. But those districts wouldn't have got schools at all, I mean, you could argue. That's I mean, very true. Just to be difficult. That's absolutely. I mean, look at Glasgow East. I mean, this government. I see you were watching Newsnight last <laughs> night because you saw those statistics which I saw. And I was shocked, shocked, shocked. Um, it's absolute, yeah, it's absolutely, you know, it's absolutely, there's, there's no question about that. But uh, the violence with organized t crime tends to be utterly arbitrary when it is, when it is deployed. Um, there is no court system. Only you know. amongst their own, though. Come on. No, I mean. no, no, not amongst their own. That's no, the whole I'm, point. Anyone no. who they don't, they don't happen to like. But, so it, but it is true, isn't so it? They're, like, they're, I mean, but let me, uh, you know, when it comes to uh, Kosovo, for example, which is, uh, it's very, by the way, Kosovo and Al the Albanians get a very unfair rap in terms of, oh, it's all Albanian organized crime. This kind of sort of mythology. Everyone in the Balkans was involved with this. Um, and there was really no national difference. Arkan, the one time that the CIA picked up Arkan was when they had a tip-off that he was going to meet his Kosovo Albanian heroin contact on the border between Kosovo and Serbia. And Arkan then was tipped off that there was something dodgy about the meeting and he didn't turn up. But the point was, is Arkan, while he was leading a paramilitary group in Kosovo, was also dealing heroin with Albanians. And that happened all over Yugoslavia. Sorry, I, di I digress. But if you are a poor Albanian peasant in the northwest of Kosovo, and someone comes along to you and says, look, can you take your donkey over to Montenegro, and can you take these, um, you know, a thousand cartons of uh, Marlborough with you, right? And who knows, there may even be some heroin stacked in some of those. Well, but let's say they're not. Let's say they're just duty not paid cigarettes, part of a smuggling, a smuggling racket. So there's absolutely no opprobrium socially as far as the Albanian peasant is concerned. Right, what you're doing is, is you're undermining, you're funding paramilitary systems, you're undermining you know, good governance here, there and everywhere. But what are you going to do if, that's your, if, if you're the peasant, you have no other employment opportunities and you've got eight children to feed? Actually, organized crime in that situation is providing a social good. There's absolutely no question about it from, from my mind. And so when we do, it's like, I mean, one of the, uh, the point when I decided to write this book was, uh, I was, it was in April 2003, and I was at the House of Commons talking to a bunch of MPs about the Balkans because I was trying to encourage the integration of the Balkans into the European Union. And one of, the, uh, one of the MPs stood up and said, these guys in the Balkans have got to do something about organized crime. They're allowing organized crime all over our streets and cities. Until they show that they're going to be tough on it, then we're going to do something. We're, we're, we're not going to let them into the EU. And that's the point where my cup runneth over. Because it was a month after the assassina assassination of Zoran Djindjic, the Serbian prime minister. And Djindjic was assassinated because he put in place three months earlier a Witness Protection Act, and he was, uh, and basically one of the major bosses in Belgrade was about to was about to sing in court, and that's why Jinjic was killed. And what really pissed me off was that when we talk about the Balkans doing something about organized crime, we sit in the House of Commons or write in the Guardian or the Times or wherever it is, we don't put our lives on the line. If you want to do something about uh, about good governance in somewhere like the Balkans, then you know, then 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 your life is your life is on the line, and that's part of the issue of the of the absence of governance within organised criminal systems. There's quite a few questions. Should we have the gentleman at the? Well, should we start with this gentleman at the back who's standing up, and then? Oh, sorry. Yes, I didn't see. Um, uh, the first thing I wanted to say is I'm working my way through The Sopranos on DVD, so thanks for the spoiler. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I wanted to ask <laughs> about the tobacco trade. Um, in that case, it's not just about uh, organised crime and, and greedy consumers, there's also the complicity 
of the, the legal business in, in some documented cases. Uh, to what extent do you think... That's what you say, by the same way, on the record. Uh, I'm just saying okay. that there's been some uh, court cases and judgments and rulings which would... No, I'm only saying that because I need to protect my ass legally here. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> but, the, you know, there has been settlements out of court, there's been cases, there's memorandums of understandings between the EU and Philip Morris, <laughs> etc. There are, you know... No, look, don't worry, I'm, I'm with you on this. Okay, so... Um, my question is, you know, I'm sure this is one example, there may be others. To what extent do you think, uh, given the sheer extent of illicit trade, do you think illicit trade and, and business is involved and, and what can be done in terms of controlling the legal supply uh, and control of the supply chain? Um, uh, on the first point, unfortunately, you're the second person who I've, I've spoiled the... Uh, <laughs> The, the surprise, the last one was my publicity uh, uh, manager at Bodley Head, and she was, I, you know, since then, the sales of the book have just collapsed. Uh, I, I'm not going to talk about The Wire. I could talk about The Wire all evening, but I don't want to spoil anything for anyone. So, um, sorry about that. Um, uh, look, uh, uh, you know, you're absolutely right. The, uh, I'm not going to mention the name of any companies but complicity in the duty not paid cigarette trade around the world is uh, absolutely massive. And to their credit, again, the only people who have been pursuing this has been the European Union. Um, in terms of, I really want to, uh, in terms of law enforcement, the European Union tries really, really hard um, to catch people who are screwing us all on a regional or a global, global level uh, they did this with the European single arrest warrant, which when, I, I'll come back to the cigarette things in a sec, but this is very important. The European single arrest warrant, uh, which was um, finally after, you know, everyone, the Tories, of course, at the, at the forefront on it, were criticizing the European single arrest warrant, saying end of British sovereignty and legal matters, you know, we're all going to die as a consequence. And three months after, uh, the government uh, agreed to, the, uh, I mean, got the European single arrest warrant through Parliament. The, the, the bombings on the 7th of July happened in the underground. And one of them, if you remember, one of the perpetrators uh, went to Italy because he also had an Italian passport. Had it not been for the European single arrest warrant, that man would to this day be in the black hole which masquerades as a legal system in Italy, um, awaiting ex extradition till kingdom come. Uh, because of the European single arrest warrant, we got him back within a matter of, of days and he was able to face due legal process here in the United Kingdom. And really, there are crimes you know, which damage all of us, both by state and non-state actors, and we need some legal provision between states in order to facilitate this. OLAF, the anti-corruption operation in the European Union, which suffers from competition between the various member states on a bureaucratic level nonetheless has worked really hard on this cigarette issue as has the as have the Italians ironically um, uh, but they've worked really hard and they've hard, worked hard to nail the corporate aspect of it because this is really you know I mean it's an it's an absolute disgrace what has, been, what has been going on. And this happens in a number of trades. I know that Alex Yearsley from Global Witness is here in the audience uh, somewhere. And Global Witness has done fantastic work, as have a number of, uh, uh, of other people, in exposing in what are undoubtedly illegal trades, dealing with resources, particularly in Africa, but also, uh, also elsewhere, in which licit economic actors are deeply c com, uh, complicit. Now, uh, of, their, of themselves, uh, governments are not going to confront those licit actors involved in illicit trade. And this is where, this is one very positive thing, uh, coming back to one of the, the, the earlier questions, um, is actually, and I use Global Witness in the book because it demonstrates that a tiny little uh, outfit on a shoestring budget in West London can actually end up in Hollywood, mm. which is what <coughs> happened with Blood Diamond. God bless their cotton socks. Uh, but this was because they mobilized politically and they succeeded. And it shows that you can do something 
uh, about this trade. And the tobacco companies, you know, not in terms of, of class action in the United States, but worldwide, the tobacco companies, if anyone wants to do a global witness on tobacco companies, you know, get stuck in. The gentleman over there in the back. Misha, can I ask uh, you about reaction to your book? Yeah, I know. Oh, it's our uh, track. You've talked about you kept running over when you met a bunch of MPs. You, uh, I think, uh, said in the FT that you met another bunch of MPs the other day. I don't know which committee it was. Do you not get the impression that wizard as the book is, they're going to say, oh, Misha Kelly's exaggerating everything. Misha Kelly's, it's not exactly got it wrong, but, you know, he's, he, it's, all, it's, all, it's all too much, all this. And that, therefore, um, you know, destroys the message. Uh, but are you more optimistic than that? It, it, you know, it's interesting. It's interesting you should ask that for a whole range of reasons, but I'm not going to go into them now. Um, no, it's, but it's really interesting for the following. Uh, for, uh, this is from, kind of from a writer's point of view, actually. Uh, one of, the, one of, one of the, the pluses about the book for me, I'll tell you, you know, obviously up until now, all I've written about uh, in, in public is Eastern Europe and, and Russia and the Balkans and that sort of stuff. And uh, I'll be perfectly honest, uh, I, I was bored witless with the Balkans, you know. God bless them, I still go back there, I still follow everything that happens there. If you want to ask me about Serbia, I can tell you about Serbia, Bulgaria, uh, And i got lots of friends saying, oh, but I was bored of it. And of course, more to the point, so were all my potential employers, you know. And so I got to a stage where I couldn't write about the Balkans anymore. What else did I know about? I knew about organized crime because I've been living it for 15 years. And uh, so uh, I did the book in order to get out of the Balkans um, and also to write about the world. Um, and although there are large parts of the world that I write about in this book which I didn't know about, and I didn't, there were large parts of the world that I did know about, but no one ever asked me to write about them. And so I thought that, well, I could, I could, start, I, I could start doing that. Of course, what that means is that I confess there is a kind of fragmented aspect to the book. I, I have tried to structure it to explain that there are connections going around the world and that what happens in Japan does sometimes meld into what is, what is happening in, in, in Colombia, for example. Um, but uh, I'm not necessarily always uh, <coughs> successful uh, at that. And it may be, Jack, as you say, that I've kind of that I've gone over the t that I've gone over the top, but it's all too overwhelming about people. But shall I tell you what I really felt writing the book? This is a you know this is a huge part of the global economy, global politics, and global history, and it is not being written about mm -hmm. as a systematic global whole. And so even if the Home Affairs Select Committee, which is what it was, uh, says, uh, "Oh, it's all too much. You exaggerate." Anyhow, we know that from the Balkans. Blah blah blah. Um, I just say, mm. well, okay, fair enough, but I've written it. I must admit, I mean, you know, having read this, I didn't think it was exaggerated at all. <clears throat> You'd be relieved to know. Say, I'm not saying... No, I know, you, you're just saying, saying that many people suspect that it is. <laughs> yeah, I know, but I'll tell you what, if you start making allegations against named people, and some of them, bizarrely, actually still alive, um, you've got to be pretty sure of what you're saying. And, I, you know, it, given that it got through the publisher's lawyers... I mean, and these aren't sort of roundabout, sort of, um, you know, sort of um, uh, circuitous kind of allegations. I mean, these are absolutely sort of, you know, they're bullseye allegations against very specific individuals who actually, even though you say it wouldn't cause them much of a fuss if you were just doing this in the UK in a book, they would probably come after you because it's probably a bit of a sport for them, a bit of a hobby. So, I, I mean, I must admit, I, I, know, I understand what you're saying, but it didn't, it didn't occur to me. Anyway, the, the lady here, yes. Um, I just wondered whether you uh, you have a view or an insight on, on how it happens that Karadzic and Mladic are still escaping. Uh, well, quite simply, um, both Mladic and Karadzic could have been picked up at a very early stage in Bosnia and Herzegovina um, uh, uh, after 1995 and 1996 and the deployment of international forces. 
But both the French and the Americans chickened out about doing it uh, at the time. Since then, <coughs> it's quite simple. I mean, you know, sovereignty is with Karadzic in the Republika Srpska in, in Bosnia Herzegovina, and uh, it's it would require some really smart intelligence to get him. In terms of Mladic, Mladic was protected uh, under Kostunz uh, um, by the Serbian by the Serbian government, uh, most regrettably, um, and by parts of military intelligence, not by all the intelligence community in Serbia, w part of which has been working quite hard to do something about it. Um, uh, it th it's going to be very difficult for Serbia to move uh, fast very quickly in terms of EU accession unless they get hold of Mladic. Karadzic is a different issue because of where he is. Um, uh, but it's essentially because they've been protected by people uh, on one level and on another level uh, other people weren't assiduous enough in, in, in getting hold of them. I mean, the, you know, it's well documented. The Americans had uh, Mladic effectively surrounded in Han Piesak at the at the beginning of the uh, of the deployment of troops in in Bosnia Herzegovina, and uh, Karadzic also was sort of you know he was in the French zone. The French didn't want to do it for whatever. So that's it. Okay, we've we've still got quite a few questions. Um, should we have the, bring the microphone down here to the lady in red? <laughs> could talk a bit about the sex trade um, and also though I was incredibly naive but in terms of what can be done for it all to be better again so with the drugs trade you can talk about um, it not being criminal anymore but surely that's just going on forever how can you ever end it can you there is a there's a debate going on about it's a very complicated debate about uh, the trafficking of women um, for sex work, and you got to kind of. There's a revisionist thing coming in, which is saying that basically <coughs> women uh, um, uh, make a ch make a choice about going into going into sex work, and this is talking about South Africa. It's talking about Eastern Europe. It's talking about uh, other parts of Africa is talking about South America. Um, uh, my feeling is as follows. That a, a significant percentage of women from Eastern Europe came into Western Europe in the early 1990s knowing that they were going to go into uh, sex work. A significant percentage. A significant percentage, and I think that percentage has been increasing since the early 1990s, came to find work in, in Western Europe and elsewhere around the world and had no idea what was going to happen to them. Uh, that second category, when it, when it happens, uh, uh, it, it leads to the creation of a, cl a class of women whose experiences are so unspeakable um, that, uh, you know, uh, it should be debated in, in Parliament uh, every day. Um, uh, the difficulty is, with as with narcotics, is, is that a culture has developed whereby um, uh, there is not enough moral opprobrium <coughs> Uh, to the use of uh, the use of prostitutes in in Western Europe and and elsewhere, um, and there is not anything like enough money, not enough sufficient law enforcement capacity devoted to this area. Now, the problem is is with, is that you know prostitution will exist. I, you know, I, I've had uh, arguments about this on a different level with people while researching the book. Than on the the narcotics one, but again, I come down to to legalisation, and the reason I come down, one of the reasons I come down for legalisation of prostitution, uh, uh, is uh, because of the pub public health thing, and the health of the w health of the women involved, and that if you have 
state institutions con controlling what is going on, then you are likely to reduce the opportunities for abuse. Where you do have widespread abuse in Western Europe, in Israel, uh, in the United Arab Emirates, uh, in Japan, it, I, I, I can't describe how, how, how awful it is. Uh, what is interesting is, is that in discussions with governments around the world, um, this is seen as the lowest pri priority in terms of enforcement in transnational organized crime. The State Department in the United States is the only institution which really puts time and money in trying to track this problem and every year it comes up with very detailed reports and it imposes sanctions on those governments which are allowing, which are not implementing le legislation and, and, and allowing uh, the trafficking of, of women to go ahead. We here in the United Kingdom still consider women who are picked up in brothels who've been trafficked here first, first and foremost as illegal immigrants. And that is the primary way that they're, that, they're, that they're dealt with. We have to have a situation whereby anyone who's picked up in, in brothel raids, unless prostitution is legalized and there are other controls, we have to see them as victims primarily and work on that assumption as opposed to working on them as, um, uh, working on them as uh, illegal immigrants. Well, we, we should go over there because the microphone's over there, but you were laughing at no, that no, response. No, no, not laughing. I was just yeah, it, tittering. Constitution is legal, isn't it? It's Sorry, it's soliciting that is illegal, but if, if it, the, the point is, is yeah, that soliciting in this country effectively drives the trade underground. So, uh, okay. Oh, it's a point you raised earlier, Misha, in relation to the compare and contrast the styles between Europe and the US in terms of trying to fight some of the, the organized crime elements. In, in Italy, they elect their organized criminals to, to, to become prime ministers and presidents. Um, and in here, we gentrify them and let them buy premiership football clubs. Um, <laughs> in, in relation to the states, they've recently re reawoken their organized crime um, sort of. Um, um, not the, the, old, the old Cold, Cold War days, um, uh, yet they still have former members of the CIA and FBI representing Bogilevich uh, as, 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 as his lawyer and legal representative. Do you think the Americans are, are stealing a march on trying to deal with some of the uh, issues and are actually planned ahead a little bit more now that they've finally woken up to the threat from, from particularly the Russian threat? Well, it's the set. I mean, you talk to people in, in soccer here and you talk to the DOJ. Um, in the United States, and they all recognize the corrosive effect of, 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 Russian, of Russian money. The DOJ has the legal capacity to do more about it than soccer does. Um, sorry. Um, and the DOJ has some real convictions uh, behind it. I find I find the DOJ a more a more convincing outfit in its various forms than British law enforcement in this sort of thing, um, and uh, uh, I, I I think again paradoxically Amer uh, America is 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 more effective worldwide on this issue. Uh, one of the reasons is and. I'll, use the example of BAE systems. The British government just trashes the whole investigation illegally, as we now know. Uh, and it's all over. The Saudis have got away with it. BAE systems have got away with it. Um, and who picks up the ball and runs with it? The Department of Justice in Washington. And why does that happen? It happens because well, one of the reasons why it happens is the bribes were allegedly play, paid in dollars. Anyone who hands over a dollar to anyone else illegally, anywhere around the world, immediately is a potential jurisdiction of uh, the Department of Justice, which I think is kind of an uh, interesting way of doing things. Uh, but I take my hat off to the DAJ because they are pursuing this relentlessly. And when they get the bit between their teeth, and they've done it with the Ukrainians, and they've done it with some Russians. N no, although the, Kaz the, the Kazakhstan game isn't over. It's not finished yet, don't you think? No, not $8 million a year, which is what they've been paying off the installed investigation. 
And it's a very, I mean, it's a big case, the Kazakh case. I don't think it's finished yet. And we'll see what happens when Obama gets back in. I think it'll be, it'll, it'll be revived. But anyway, sorry, it gets back in. It's, it's, uh, and, uh, it's, uh, it's been a long day. Uh, just, uh, but anyway, when he gets in. Okay. Have we got another question? Okay. Uh, where's the microphone? We should bring it to this gentleman here as he's closest to you. And then pass it along over there next. Hello. As a writer of non-fiction, to what extent you mentioned The Sopranos, Blood Diamond, The Wire, to what extent do you feel influenced or, um, I don't know, you, you have your awareness raised by fiction or popular uh, culture? I kind of, I mean, I use, I use, fiction, in, I use fiction in the book because uh, often it describes things better and more uh, I immediate than, than non-fiction. Uh, can do, and uh, when I see something like, you know, I mean, I've done research about global crime all around the world, and I see something in the wire, I'm not going to say what, because I don't want to, uh, you know, everyone, stop what you're doing, stop listening to me, go out and buy five seasons of DVDs of the wire, that's all I can do. When I see something where, in like half an episode, they encapsulate something that I've been trying to explain in just 20 minutes of, of television, you know, and they do it in a way which is funny, which is uh, fascinating, shocking. I, you know, that's when I, as the nonfiction writer, feel, you know, I wish I could just, you know, there are times where I think, the thing about the nonfiction writer is you're writing there and you think, oh, I have to stay the facts all the bloody time. <laughs> it's so much easier if I could just say, you know, and when you talk to fiction writers, they sort of say, you know, the trouble is, is I don't really know what's going on and it's all sort of woolly and mm. I don't have the kind of facts that you have in which to, you know. So we have this sort of uh, fiction and non-fiction writers. Um, but it's a peculiarly rich genre, um, uh, organized crime. I mean, I really do think that the Sopranos and the uh, the Sopranos and the Wire uh, has uh, taken it to a, a, a new level. But you know, since I, I was watching in the middle of this, I went to, in the middle of researching the book. I was watching The Alchemist, um, uh, the National, the Ben Johnson play, and at the heart of The Alchemist. I suddenly, I almost sort of, you know, stood up in the National and said, it's a 419 scam. They're doing an advanced fee fraud just like the Nigerians. And that's exactly what they're doing. And the play is about 419. And so, you know, it's incredibly, it's often very, very illuminating uh, fiction on, on, on this issue. So I like it a lot. Okay, should we, the gentleman over here? question relating to um, Russian organized crime and the arms business. In The Lord of War, the Victor Bank character at one point goes out to uh, the former Soviet Union as it's, as it's um, well, as the Soviet Union is, uh, is falling apart and um, speaks with a, with a guy running a big um, arms dump. And the general decides that he can just kind of sell off on his own, on his own initiative, a large part of the arms stocks and, and funnel them towards Sierra Leone and Liberia. I was wondering, is that kind of the kind of stuff that actually happened? Were some generals in Russia just collaborating with organized crime? Uh, if anything, it was kind of, if anything, it was mild. Uh, it's absolutely, it was, it was fantastically uh, accurate. Um, and here, this again was the really interesting thing with the independence of Ukraine. There were, even to this day, really, talking about the independence of Ukraine in certain sectors, just it's 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 an it's an irrelevant category, as it were. And yes, that is absolutely what was what was happening. What you tend not to see are the guys who became really rich, who were the middlemen, facilitating between Victor Boot and the general. And you don't see the the G, the, the military intelligence people quite so openly as they uh, uh, as they function, but. Yes, that is accurate. I mean, I, I get a Lord of War is a is a is a film I quote in the, the book as well, and it's it's largely because of that that moment when the Victor Boot character is exchanging with Charles Taylor for a couple of bullets, a few dams, and that's really what it is about. It's the transfer of surplus weaponry stocks in 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 the former Soviet Union uh, for, for in exchange for mineral resources in Africa, which then get moved 
to the West. And it, that was the perfect crime, and in a way, the biggest crime of the 1990s. Okay. I mean, that, that involves President Mitterrand. Oh, he's dead. Yes. <laughs> you can talk. Yeah, Say anything you like. Oh, he's alive. Uh, I don't know. It's very difficult. I, you know, what can I say? I do have to be a bit careful about what I say. But it, you know, involves involves all sorts of people. A lot of people in the West, in very influential positions. Okay. I think we've got to draw it to a we've got to draw it to a close there because it's nine o'clock, and it's as long as he was uh, supposed to do. Unless it's a really urgent question. Oh, it looks urgent-ish. No, is it? How does one define urgency? What would you do to catalyze the evolution of legal institutions in Russia and elsewhere, where obviously there's a vacuum, that's part of the biggest reason that... Oh, that is a... That's a, that's a big, that's a big <laughs> question. Um, I, for the moment, for the moment, what I do, do is, A, personally, of course, I can do bugger all about it, but what I would do is I would sit back and wait and see, you know, whether life under Gazprom is better than life under the KGB. <laughs> Who knows? Maybe they're the same. They are the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We should thank him.